topic we're going to be talking about tonight is PowerShell Core. This is a topic I spoke about at a conference several months back. I've since updated the slides. I've updated some of the information to include PowerShell 7, uh, as well as my demo will include some information on PowerShell 7, and part of the script will actually reach out to PowerShell 7 boxes. So it's a little bit more uh, all-encompassing, but it will give you the information you need to know going forward with PowerShell Core and 7. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Kevin Knox. I'm a senior platform engineer in the Research Triangle Park that's in uh, North Carolina. So I'm a huge PowerShell advocate. I really like to teach people how to use PowerShell. I think that's a great way to learn as well as when you teach people to, to write PowerShell scripts, you actually you know, kind of expand what you can do, especially if you're on a team of people who don't use PowerShell. Getting other people to use PowerShell brings more minds into what is it possible that we can do with PowerShell. So I like the joke that it's a way of automating automation. When other people start writing PowerShell because you taught them, it's uh, way more than you know what you could do on your own. There's different ideas that come up and just different ways of looking at problems and how to solve them. So because of that, I'm a huge PowerShell advocate, and I try to convince everybody I can to use PowerShell in some way or another. So I'm also one of the leaders of the Research Triangle PowerShell Users Group. I've been doing that for several years now, and I've been using PowerShell since version 3. So to start with the basics, what is PowerShell? So you know, PowerShell is a command line interface for Windows operating systems. But that's based on .NET Framework. So the latest version of .NET Framework is 4.8, I believe. And PowerShell, the latest version is 5.1, which uh, will be available on a host of operating systems um, all the way back to 2012, 2008. But it'll come by default on, I believe, Server 2016, 2019, and Windows 10. And like I said, those are based on the .NET framework. So with Microsoft releasing .NET Core and that being open source, PowerShell uh, you know, essentially has become PowerShell Core. So PowerShell Core is based on the .NET Core framework with version 2 running up to PowerShell Core 6. And with the recent announcement of PowerShell 7, that's actually based off of .NET Core 3. So with that, you can basically run PowerShell across a bunch of operating systems, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, as well as uh, the ability to run them on IoT and ARM-based devices. And like I said, with PowerShell 7, it's the new announcement from Microsoft. Um, it'll be based on .NET Core 3. Basically, with the release of PowerShell 6 or PowerShell Core, uh, there's a lot of usage by Linux users, but not so much for Windows users, because since everything is retooled with .NET Core in mind, it didn't work with the older .NET framework-based modules. So there's a lot of compatibility issues if you're trying to run uh, stuff on PowerShell 6. With PowerShell 7, uh, the basic idea was to bring more compatibility into PowerShell for Windows users, so they're expecting 90% roughly compatibility, and bring more Windows users on board. So if you look at the chart here, you can see that really it's taken off with Linux users, but Windows uh, users have been kind of hanging back and hanging on PowerShell 5, including myself. I only use PowerShell 7 just for testing and messing around, but it's not something I've used on a daily basis at work or anything like that. So the uh, general release uh, PowerShell 7 is going to come shortly after .NET Core 3. I don't believe there's a final date on that, but it should be sometime in the next couple of months. And as part of the you know, PowerShell 7 announcement, they said, quote, they expect it to be a full replacement for Windows PowerShell 5.1. Not that it would come in the operating system necessarily, uh, at least not right away, but you know, down the road it's possible that instead of PowerShell 5.1 we'll start seeing that and the operating system. And that's kind of important because PowerShell 5.1 is pretty much baked as it is right now. 
they're not going to be doing any feature upgrades or anything like that. The IC is going to stay exactly the same. So any new improvements are going to come to the newer versions of PowerShell. So getting that newer version on PowerShell on, you know, people's boxes is really where they're going to actually be able to take advantage of the new features. So I know a lot of people won't even go out and install PowerShell. So if PowerShell 5.1 is all that's there, that's probably all you're going to see. And so you really need that backwards compatibility and you need the ability to um, hopefully in the future have an update that, you know, brings PowerShell 7 onto everyone's box. So the screenshots from a little while ago, it shows, you know, version 6.2 release of PowerShell Core, but it's the same exact page for PowerShell 7. So you go out to the GitHub, you can find all of the releases for PowerShell. They have it, you know, pretty much in every flavor, whether it's installing for Linux, uh, Mac OS, Windows, um, and also ARM, I believe is also in there. But recently I've seen there's a lot more ways to install it. So obviously you can go out here, get the package, install it. But there's also uh, the PS release tools module by Jeff Hicks, which you import that module, pull it down from uh, PowerShell Gallery, and uh, that will install and keep your PowerShell up to date. And another way that I've seen to install it, which I think is pretty good, is Thomas Muir uh, has his one line PowerShell install, which I'll show you in just a second. But he also has a lot of other good information out of here, uh, out there. So I put these links in here because um, I think this is really a good, this is kind of what I use for putting the most recent updates to this presentation together. I think this is a good information on you know, covering kind of all the basics, remoting and how to install it, update it, um, as well as, you know, the source for GitHub. So I would say definitely bookmark these, these links here. So today I'm going to go through a couple different things. So we're going to get started with an install. Um, I'll go over the PowerShell versus PowerShell core. You can see kind of the differences with some of the variables and things like that. I'm going to go over OpenSSH and remoting into PowerShell Core, PowerShell 7 boxes, as well as showing you kind of what it looks like on Linux. The uh, remoting to between Windows and Linux boxes, as well as I have a Mac OS box I'm going to show you. Uh, I'll give you a script demo to kind of go through um, differences in the commandlets between the different operating systems. and we're going to start off with the install. So I'll show you right here. Here's the the method I use to install on all of my boxes, um, except for Mac OS. I had to install that manually. You can install that through the package manager brew, but I had a, a few issues getting it installed. So these one-liners will go out and do pull down the script to install it, pull down the package, and as well as install it. If you add the dash preview, it'll do PowerShell 7. If you uh, leave that off, it'll do PowerShell 6.2. And there's a couple other flags in there. But like I said, go through those links and you'll see the information for which, uh, which parameters you can pass to it. So let me go right into demos. Um, and I'll start by just showing you guys kind of what I have out there. So, um, I have three boxes out here, a uh, Linux box, a Mac box, uh, and a Windows box. Yeah, um, you need to make that bigger. You need to make that bigger. Well, this doesn't matter because I'm not going to show you anything in, in SSH, but yeah, just please, that they're running. Just make sure that, you know, yeah. Later. Yeah, I think my Visual Studio code should be a little bit bigger. Um, and I can show you just the VMware console windows. we got a Mac box. And um, Windows box and Linux. There's my Linux. This one, I don't know if that's going to be big enough or not. Is that at least readable? Not really. No? Uh, it's passable. Yeah, but it's only going to be yeah, I guess you can do that. There you go. Hey, guys, uh, give us some feedback in the chat. If it's non-readable, we'll work on it. make it bigger. If it's bad, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Uh, 
I don't know if that's big enough to read or not, but this yeah, is yeah. at the start. Um, uh, I'm just going to get my cheat notes up because I hate typing stuff in wrong. Actually, it's here. All right. Um, here for the win. So just to start, I'm going to show you there's um, – if I go out and look at the, the PS session configuration, this is going to show me what uh, session uh, configurations I can set up. So if, if I want to remote into this box, um, this is what's available, right? So basically your standard PowerShell, PowerShell 32-bit, um, and the workflow stuff. Um, I'm going to use to show off the install, um, this one-line install, which is in one of the links that I had uh, mentioned to you. Um, and it's just doing an invoke expression, pulling down um, and running the uh, the script for the install, and it does it as an MSI install. So it's not completely silent. Um, there are switches where you can make it silent, but I just kind of want to run through it. And then enabling PS remoting. Um, there's some finicky things I've found um, where it seems like some of the settings you put in here don't actually end up passing through, but we'll go through that as it comes up. And actually, I have this box snapshotted with everything installed and everything not installed, so hopefully something doesn't go right, then I can go ahead and just change and revert hey, back. I got a quick question. Yeah. So my question is, can you use PowerShell 5, I mean, can you use um, Core and remote into a remote computer running PowerShell 5, I guess, or yes. running a script using PowerShell 5? You'll see a lot of remote examples. That's a lot of what I'm going to show you. So um, you'll pretty much see any way you're going to want to remote. I'll have a demo for that. So give me a few minutes and I'll get to that. Um, so I just did the PowerShell 6 install. Um, let me go through real quick what this is doing. So it's the invoke expression. It's using this PowerShell script that's out, um, on this path here or this uh, URL. Um, I'm doing the US MSI, so I see the um, the, the prompts that you get if you did an MSI install. Um, I'm also going to install PowerShell 7, and so you'll see here the dash preview uh, installs the preview version. Um, and so let me copy that and run that. Nishant raised his hand. Is there another question? If there's a question, he puts it in chat or something. If someone wants to uh, just mention it. Does control plus work, plus work here? No, I can't control plus plus in a remote console window. Um, I'll go back through these when I have it up in Visual Studio Code so we can review it if, if it's needed. Um, so I've done both these installs. Um, in the uh, MSI pop-up, I told it to make sure to um, add the path. If you don't do the MSI installer, um, there's a flag you can put that says add the path so that, um, like you'll see right now, if I do PWSH, um, it's not going to work because it's not in the environment variable path. Um, you have to restart for that to take effect. Um, probably log off, log on might do the same thing. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick restart and then we'll start looking at remoting. Hey, Kevin, want you to jump in there? 
I just want to let people know that you can zoom in your WebEx screen. Each one can zoom to their own level. If the, if the uh, console that Kevin's working in is a little tiny, it's on the left hand of the WebEx screen. There's a plus minus, or you can do control plus plus on your keyboard. All right, so now that I've rebooted, um, it should come up. PWSH is going to get me into PowerShell 6, which I had installed. Um, I can exit that, and then I can do PWSH-preview. Um, and that's going to launch PowerShell 7. Um, one thing I found kind of interesting about this is um, they're both going to install under program files. If I could type this right. See, that's why I copy and paste everything. Um, but you'll see under the 7 dash preview, there's another preview folder. And it does this thing where it has this uh, dash preview dot command. Um, it actually creates the environment variable path to the preview folder, points to that um, that command file, which then points back to the PowerShell 7 preview folder, and that has the um, pwsh.exe. So the executable is technically the same name. It just does this weird thing for uh, the preview so that it comes up. You don't mix up pwsh for PowerShell 6 and 7. Um, so like I said before, um, I noticed when I was doing this, even though I did the install and I said enable PS remoting, um, if I go back, um, into PowerShell and, um, let me make sure I know where I'm at here. Yeah. Uh, if I try to get the... PS session configuration. I want to select the name to make it easier. Um, you'll see it's the same as it was before. So if I actually go into uh, PowerShell 6, enable PS remoting, uh, tab complete fail. And go into um, 7, enable PS remoting. And now I look at the configuration. Now I see that I have PowerShell 6 and PowerShell 7 available. Um, so I don't want to do everything from the console here. I'm going to move into uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, but there's a couple things um, I need to do. Uh, actually, I can. Can you make it a little bigger in code? Yeah, I can make it bigger in code. But um, let me just show a couple of things across uh, PowerShell version. So if I'm in this in standard PowerShell, which I should be in right now because I think I exited the other sessions. Um, over here, you'll see 5.1 is current version. You have some you know, basic information about it. Um, here on my uh, desktop, I already have uh, uh, 
uh, PowerShell 6 and 7 installed. Um, in Visual Studio Code, you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner, you actually get a, uh, a button with the PowerShell extension that will do a drop-down and let you switch to different versions of PowerShell. So right now I'm running 6. Um, I can switch to 7. I've tested everything on 6. I don't want to – shouldn't affect anything, but I'm not going to change the version I'm running right now. Um, and so here I can do dollar sign PS version. And you'll see that the information is actually a, a little bit different. Um, so I still get a PS version, PS edition, um, but you get some different stuff like the Git commit ID, the OS, um, and some different information uh, when you do PS version table in PowerShell 6 or um, PowerShell 7 versus PowerShell 5. Um, so, we have PS remoting enabled, uh, I've gone through, I've shown you the version table. I'm going to run a couple different things here to show you what's going on for remoting. Oh, I should probably close Discord. Sorry, guys. All right. So I'm going to run this command here. Um, what this is going to do, it's going to do a vote command against that uh, Windows box that I was on, uh, that we saw on the console. Um, it's going to run uh, the PS session configuration, return uh, just the names, um, and I'm going to get the ones that uh, just have PowerShell in them. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. That gives me PowerShell 6, PowerShell 7. Um, I feel like I'm missing part of this for my script. But um, then what I'm going to do is, because uh, I actually want to show you guys a general connection with the configuration. So when you go to open a session with a configuration, I think I cut part of this out. Um, essentially, it's your session, the computer name. You can type in the configuration name. Um, and so PowerShell 6, PowerShell 6.2.2, PowerShell 7, that will select which version of PowerShell that you're remoting in with. Um, if you don't do a configuration name, it's going to default to um, PowerShell 5.1. Um, and it'll happen anytime you use, you're using WinRM for remoting. Um, it's always going to default to 5 unless you do the configuration name. So just part of a little example I was going to do is I wanted to open up a couple different sessions against this box. And so um, I went through, I got all the sessions, saved them. Here they are. Now I'm going to loop through them, and um, I'm going to open new sessions for each one. And after I do that, you'll see the sessions here. Um, actually, I guess I did that. I didn't close my sessions from before. That's my fault. All right, let's run that again. All right, so open up all those sessions. Now I'm just going to go ahead and just see, get back PS version table for each one of those. And um, one thing I found kind of interesting is the configuration names are different. Like it'll say 6.2 versus 6.2.2, uh, 7 preview, 7 preview 2. Um, but what you'll find is you really only have two versions there, even though you have these different configuration names. And um, it basically just comes down to whatever the essentially latest version that's installed, even though it shows the other configurations, are the, the ones you end up getting. So we have two versions of 6.2.2. So uh, both these ones that say PowerShell 6 are both 6.2.2, and two versions of PowerShell 7, um, Preview 2, um, which you see there and you see there. So um, I'm going to go back and remove those sessions now. Um, and that's generally when you're doing WinRM remoting, that's exactly how it's going to go. I'm going to show you now how uh, the newer OpenSSH stuff works with PowerShell remoting. Um, and 
in order to do this, I'll have to go back to the console uh, for a moment, but because um, it won't let me, when I was trying this before, it will not let me install unless I'm local for installing the uh, OpenSSH server capability. Um, I did that wrong, PS Windows. But I can go out and I can check um, on that system uh, what is installed. So you can see it installed the client when it did the PowerShell install, um, but it didn't install uh, the server. And so let's go back over here and Dang it. There we go. And I'm just going to run this right here. Add Windows capability. Um, so for SSH, it is a feature on uh, Windows 10 and I think it's 1903 and the version before that and it's a feature on server 2019 um, same as far as the feature releases on older versions you'll have to go out and download it there's a github for it um, essentially you drop it in a folder there's a ps1 file that'll install it um, and I'll show you kind of how that works or at least the how it looks uh, in a second. Um, but on the newer stuff, it's basically just add Windows capability and then uh, point it to the OpenSSH feature. And it says ooh, and then you have it installed. So um, scrolling back up here, um, when I did this presentation before, I kind of had put together my own um, kind of setting in the variable pass and uh, environment pass and all that kind of stuff because I was having a lot of issues with things not doing what it was supposed to do. Um, when you go to do OpenSSH, um, essentially you have it out in this folder here. Um, you run the install.ps1, um, and it'll go ahead and kick off the install and, and create the services. And I think it creates the services. Um, you just have to make sure you set the service to start automatically. Um, but there's also some additional configuration there that needs to be done. So, uh, stop my session open. So, by default, typically the service isn't started, right? So I'm going to go ahead and start the service. Uh, if I hit the right key, um, set the type to automatic. So like I said, it doesn't do that by default. And another thing you had to do is create the firewall rules before. Um, when you do the feature install, it should have uh, the OpenSSH server and TCP rule in there that um, does everything you need to do. Now, I was still having uh, some issues with this, maybe just something wonky that I was running into. But in OpenSSH or in SSH, you need to set up a subsystem for PowerShell. And you do this across any system, Linux, Mac, um, uh, or Windows. Um, it doesn't like the spaces in program files. Um, and so the suggestion I saw was basically you know, make a, a, a symbolic link uh, and use that in order to point to um, the directory where PowerShell core is installed. If you wanted to do PowerShell 7, you just change this to 7 preview. Um, I don't know if the short name works. I hadn't tried that. Um, that's probably another possibility. So I'll show the way the file looks, but essentially I have a couple lines that I just wrote that'll go in and update the configuration files. Um, so you have this file sshd config. 
um, in uh, your program data SSH folder. And um, by default, it's not going to allow you to do password authentication. There's two ways to kind of authenticate with SSH. One is going to be using um, uh, keys, SSH keys. The other one is going to be using, you know, username, password. So you're going to want to uncomment that. So I just go find it and do a replace on it um, in the config file. Um, so I'm going to run that real quick. And the other thing you want to do is, like I had said, you need to put the subsystem for PowerShell line in there. And so essentially it's a uh, subsystem, a tab, PowerShell, another tab, um, and then uh, the symbolic link we just made. And there's a couple other little parameters you throw in there when it launches it. So I'm going to run that line too. And I can um, just do this get content and we'll see what it looks like. And so you'll see in here um, all the information for the listening address for IP v4 and v6. I guess a lot of that's coming out. Uh, but if you want to change that, you have those uh, in there. Uh, the main thing we changed here is the subsystem. We added PowerShell. Um, and um, why am I not seeing it? Uh, It's there somewhere. I promise you it's in there somewhere. It says uh, password authentication um, allowed. I don't know why I'm not seeing it though. Too much scrolling with the big text maybe. So uh, let's see here. If you want to do this on Linux, um, the config file is uh, right here. Um, etc ssh sshd uh, config um, same thing you're gonna add the subsystem powershell the path is um, user bin pwsh instead of the c like we had used um, if you want to do this on mac it's the same except it's slash user slash local slash bin um, and then once again remove the password authentication uh, commenting um, and then something I ran into, um, if you're running OpenSSH and you've connected to it before with open, a system with OpenSSH and you revert that system from a snapshot to before you installed SSH, um, it, I guess it creates a key when it um, first gets installed. And so that key will be different. And so if you try to um, remote into it with SSH, you'll uh, get an error just saying, hey, the, the key is not matching what it should. Um, you know, this could be malicious, essentially. Um, let me run this. And so this is what you're going to see the first time you remote into a uh, box using SSH. And essentially it's just saying, hey, um, this is that key that I was talking about. Um, do you trust the system? Does that look like a key that, you know, uh, belongs to that system. If you know the system you're connecting to, then you know basically just type in yes. Is it going to take my typing in yes? Okay, and then it adds it to um, the list of known hosts. Um, let me show you. Give me just a second. So if you go out to um, your users folder um, and there's this .ssh folder, um, you'll see this um, known hosts. And if you open it up, you'll see the keys, the public keys for those hosts that are out there. So PS Windows, PS Linux, um, and one of these should be for PS Mac too. Um, it should be this one here. And so that's what I'm talking about. If you go revert it uh, to a snapshot before SSH was installed, it'll create a different key and you'll get some wonkiness. Um, 
Um, so those keys are, are tailored to the, the, the remoting server, right? Or to your local machine? The server that you're remoting into. It's essentially just a, a public key from that server. Uh, that's, you know, just verifying, hey, it is what it is. And you can move those keys around from machine to machine. Yeah, you should be able to. So another thing I found that's kind of wonky, I forgot about this, is sometimes when you do SSH, uh, oh, this is a, a trap you don't want to fall into. So if you update something in the SSHD config, um, you need to restart the SSHD service afterwards. So once you do that, then it uh, should update. So it wasn't working. Um, Is there any reason why we would um, we would want to use SSH um, from Windows box to Windows box um, versus PowerShell using the core for PowerShell? Um, it's a good question. I would say maybe mostly if you're doing like non-domain join systems, because um, you can pass the local credentials. Um, I've seen some people mention that that's probably uh, better and, and let's say more secure um, for specifically to like non-domain join machines. But um, if you're on the same domain, if you have, um, you know, essentially domain credentials you can pass to it. Uh, it's, I think, personally, I would just use WinRM most of the time. I would only use SSH for, uh, you know, Mac and Linux-based systems. So wait, you, you can pass credentials to it? Or you don't have the double hop problem? Um, no, 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 I'm not talking about passing credentials. Just for logging on to that local system using SSH. Um, you, it's always going to prompt you just for the username and password, so you can pass the you know the local user account and that password. But you can do trusted host, and so you can connect without the password, right? Password. Right? Yes. So you can also but generate a SSH key and add that and uh, connect with that. And that authenticates. Yeah, without a password. Yes. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. I don't want to interrupt where you're going here, but just think about a time that makes sense for you. There's a few people that are asking, like, what is your work day like? How much are you using Core? How much are you using Windows PowerShell? Are you using Core in place of Windows PowerShell at all? Um, okay, well, those, those kinds of things. I'll be 100% honest. I am not, just because I'm doing this, I'm not necessarily a PowerShell Core advocate. Uh, I pretty much don't use it. Um, I started, like I said, I did this uh, for a conference that we had done at work a while back, an open source conference, and I just wanted to get my head wrapped around it and how it worked, um, but I didn't necessarily have a use case for it at the time. Um, I don't dislike PowerShell Core. I think it's great, but at the same time, um, I mainly manage Windows boxes, and they all have PowerShell 5 on them, and that works great. Um, but going forward, doing looking into doing some stuff in the Docker space and having to work with Linux boxes, that's where I see myself using PowerShell Core, um, you know, in, into the future. But for now, it's um, there's a lot of compatibility problems between older um, stuff that you've done in PowerShell for Windows and PowerShell Core. And so um, there's definitely use cases for it. I just don't have one right now. I mean, I guess I could if I was, because I do manage quite a few Linux boxes for proxies, but um, it's uh, difficult to then, after you've already set up an environment, you know, go through and say, oh, I want to install PowerShell Core on all these boxes. And, you know, they're hosting 20 or 30 different sites and people want to know whether or not it's going to, you know, impact anything. So when I set up or stand up a new platform, I will probably 
have PowerShell core on it. I guess that's the best way to answer the question. Is there anything else? No, I would just um, I, I would just uh, add to that and say that you know that's what people are going to find. Guys like myself, Kevin, Phil, who are predominantly Windows admins, are going to use PowerShell 5 and probably PowerShell 7 when it comes. PowerShell Core, as Kevin was saying earlier, is really about bringing the Linux community into the ways of doing, of doing PowerShell. So I bet you if we were talking to Stevie Valdinga, who's in the chat, Stevie works a lot more Linux than some people do. So um, I bet you he's probably could tell you that maybe PowerShell Core is more of his day than, let's say, me. Yeah, and actually leverage, when I first did this uh, topic, and I messaged Stevie quite a bit, asking him, you know, some different things. Um, so anyway, to continue on, um, unless there's something else I uh, want to talk about, um, I actually ran this bit of code. I didn't want to, but uh, this is actually a remote session. Um, as you can see here, InterPS session, the main difference between doing InterPS session and connecting with SSH and doing InterPS session and connecting with WinRM is this one parameter, dash host name. Um, when you do dash host name, um, it tells it to use SSH essentially. Um, and it's going to connect to the version of PowerShell that is in that um, subsystem line. Um, so if you want to change that from six to seven or whatever, you just need to make sure that um, you point it to the correct uh, binary. Um, so which one am I connected to? 622, because that's where I pointed it with that symbolic link. Um, someone's munching on the mic or something, if we can mute it. Um, so what I want to show you now is Back to my local machine, I want to create these uh, couple of variables. There are some things you're going to run into with SSH um, that I've noticed. If I'm connecting, so all three of these machines that I'm going to use for demoing tonight are on uh, my home lab domain I set up called Loxnet. Um, I have DNS for all of them, um, but when you pass the host name using the you know, the actual machine name, I've noticed um, some issues. Sometimes you have to pass it IP. Sometimes it'll work with machine name. Um, I think it really depends on the operating system. Like Linux and uh, Mac seem to like IP. It may be something I've configure, configured wrong on my lab, but I, I think they're just kind of particular sometimes because it seems like Mac is even different than Linux as well. Um, so that's why I have here, I put all, all the, the IP addresses for each machine into a variable. Um, and you'll see me go ahead and do a session with a Linux box. Or you should see me do a session with a Linux box. There we go. And this is another um, thing I found that wasn't happening before today, and then when I tested this earlier, it started happening. Um, this weird typing lag when you do an SSH session. Um, I had seen it in the past, and then when I reinstalled all this stuff, it worked perfectly fine, and then I tried to do the connections today, and it kept telling me my password was wrong. And what ended up happening is after typing my password wrong a couple times, I'd see on the line um, afterwards a letter, and it was the first letter I typed for my password. So it's like, the first character you type does not go into the password box here. Um, and so you see how I, I just hit the B key and that got, since it was the first letter, got spit out to the, the command line as soon as I entered the session. So here you see I have a session with the Linux box and the DPS version table, it's 6622. Uh, You'll notice one difference here is uh, the OS is Linux. Um, but other than that, it shows pretty much, uh, well, in platform is Unix. Other than that, it shows pretty much similar to um, how it looks on a, a Windows box. So since it was my first time uh, connecting to a Linux box, um, 
I was like, okay, well, let's see what kind of PowerShell -y things I can do. So um, I figured if I'm writing scripts, I'm going to want to know, am I on a Linux box? Am I on a Windows box? Am I on a, a Mac? And so I started messing around. I was like, okay, well, I can, you know, bring it down to PS version table dot OS, get the OS. Um, I can go ahead and do a select string on it um, and get whether or not Linux is actually in that OS. Um, if I want to throw it in a, you know, if then statement, I can go ahead and, uh, you know, have it report out that it's a Linux box. Um, I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Um, you know, let's make sure that the select string's working right. Um, so if I do the same thing with I am Windows, I obviously see that it doesn't send me a response. This I thought was kind of cool. So then I was like, well, what if I start doing some stuff like, you know, a Linux user would do? What if instead of select string, um, I go ahead and do a grep? And here I get, you know, basically the same thing I got before. So I thought, well, maybe it's doing like a, an alias or something like that. I and mean, you'll see if I run the whole thing and it, it kind of gives me the same I am Linux. So I was like, okay, maybe they just have a, an alias in there for grep. And um, it turns out there's there's no grep alias. Um, and um, if you actually do uh, grep with a capital, you'll see it's case sensitive, just like uh, it would be on Linux. So the term grep is not a, a recognized uh, commandlet. So um, then talking to uh, Steve Aldinger or Stevie Coaster, um, he told me about uh, these beautiful uh, variables that they added to PowerShell Core and uh, basically made all of my cool little messing around useless. And so you can basically just do, is it a Linux box? Is it a Windows box? Or um, is it Mac OS? Um, and if you get variable, um, you'll see that these are all out there. Is Linux, is Mac, is Windows, um, and um, is Core CLR. Um, forgive me, I did not, I think Core CLR is um, Core Command Line Ready. Um, I didn't actually check that up, but it, it should come up true, I think, on all Core boxes, PowerShell Core boxes. Um, so I can basically take that same uh, statement and just change it to is Linux, and you'll see I'm getting the same response as before. Um, so another thing I want to see is, um, all right, so I'm on a Linux box now. What do my commandlets even look like? How many commandlets do I have there? Um, and I'll tell you it's about, uh, from a, this is a base install compared to a base server 2019 install. It's about half, um, probably even a little bit less than that, maybe 30 or 40% of the commandlets that are available to you. And we'll get a little more in depth on that um, here in a bit. So um, let's go well, back I mean, to... Um, somebody mentioned in the, in the chat, I just want to um, point it out too, is that, you know, so yeah, if you're in Linux here, still a full Linux subsystem. So it's still PowerShell doing some stuff, but you should be able to access all the bash stuff, right? Yep. So you can do anything you have just from straight up rep. Any bash or other stuff, you know, set, awk and all that kind of stuff. So long as it's there, you can go find it in bin or whatever. You can fully manage the uh, Linux machine or Mac machine right from there. Yeah, and I, I just thought this was really cool, the fact that you could just pop that right in the middle of that and it works almost exactly the same as a select string. Um, so it's it's kind of cool how it's interoperable. Um, uh, where are we at? So if I want to go back into the uh, the Windows section, actually I'm probably going to, uh, I'll skip this part here because it's basically the same thing. So um, you'll see that, you know, is Windows comes out to true when I'm on a Windows box. Um, I'm just going to, end up pushing out that I am Windows. There's a bit more content, so I don't want to go through stuff that's fairly obvious. So let's say I want to open up 
a bunch of sessions now um, to different types of, of systems. Um, I can go ahead and do that. And so I'm going to set up this multi-session um, collection, and I'm going to go ahead and create each one of these. And I have not found a good way to do this, but when you're opening up all these SSH sessions, I guess doing a, a SSH key would be the best way to do it. Um, but if you don't have that set up, which I wasn't able to get configured last night to show this, um, uh, you basically just have to type in the, the password um, for each connection. And specifically, and this is where I told you, sometimes it's, it's kind of wonky between Mac and Linux. If I don't pass the username to Mac, um, it wasn't connecting for me. Um, where with Linux and Windows, it automatically assumes the, the username. Um, so I find that kind of weird as well. And then, so I'll connect with Linux, Windows, Mac, and then you'll see I'll do one connection with this. It's, it's going to use uh, PowerShell 7. Um, and I'm going to have that same box is going to have a WinRM session, um, an SSH session uh, for PowerShell 6, and another WinRM session with um, the PowerShell 7. And so it's just going to prompt me like crazy for credentials here for a minute. And once again, like you see how the password prompt is different on, on Mac OS. Um, like I said, there's just some weird uh, little differences I noticed. And once again, like I said, it, it does this thing where it just, if you type in a letter, it'll, for your first password, it'll carry that on to the command line when you get in there or when you get through with typing the passwords. So, if I go look at my sessions, you'll see um, I have three SSH sessions, uh, two using WinRM. Um, you can see uh, the configuration name, um, so specifically the one for the PowerShell 7 shows that. This is the PowerShell 5 session. Um, and um, I can start to do some cool stuff like um, passing those sessions to an invoke command and just pulling back a uh, PS version table from all those. And so you'll see here, um, one of them is PowerShell 5, you got a PowerShell 6.2, um, and that one specifically is Linux, and a 6.2 for Darwin, which ends up being Mac OS. Um, we have a 6.2 for Windows, and we have a 7 for Windows. Um, so, as part of um, you know, the talk around it before, I kind of want to show like what are the differences in commandlets between all these different versions of uh, PowerShell. So I'm going to run through a, a script here um, that's going to kind of pull back some information for us so you can see what uh, the differences look like in each version of PowerShell and you know also the different OSs. So I'm going to run through this loop here, and essentially what it's going to do is it's going to go through each session, um, and it's going to do a switch statement and determine uh, what OS we are running. Um, it's going to uh, pull in all the commandlets and do a count and get the um, the major version um, from PS version tables, so just the, the 7 or 6 or um, whatever we want. Um, oops, I messed that up. So let's run this. When it's done running, you'll see we have a few objects here with uh, all the commandlets in them, the count for the amount of commandlets, the version of PowerShell. Um, and so we have Windows, we have Linux. Um, you'll see, like I said, 593, this is a, a very basic server 2019 build, um, and it's got actually closing in almost three times the amount of commandlets of uh, Linux. Um, so Linux on 6, uh, Mac on 6, 
Windows on 6 using uh, SSH, and uh, Windows on 7 with WinRM. And you'll see the command lists are a little bit lower on um, uh, PowerShell 7 and 6 from uh, PowerShell 5, which was 593. So, uh, I wanted to take all of the um, commands that I got and um, put them out to some different variables because I think um, I was nice to see the differences. I wanted to do kind of a, a better visualization. And so I'm going to go through each one of those and pull out all the commands for each version of, of PowerShell. Um, we can go ahead and give ourselves a side-by-side -side count. And while I was writing this, I really wanted to use that uh, module that Mike put together for the uh, foreground color thing, but I didn't have time to mess with it. Sorry, Mike. And um, we're going to do a couple comparisons here. We just want to see, um, you know, which modules are on which side. And if I look at, like, uh, Mac versus Linux, um, you'll see there's actually no differences. Um, but I wanted to take this and I wanted to make it um, even easier to see um, what the differences are. You'll see total, total between all the versions, we have 615 unique commandlets. Um, and so to do that, I'm actually going to take these and, and compile them into um, uh, a list of all the commands and what version of PowerShell that commandlet exists on. So I took all these commandlets, five, six, seven, threw them into a variable called all commands, and I'm going to run that through here. And so uh, essentially what that looks like is now I get the name of the commandlet, I get each version of PowerShell and whether or not that commandlet um, exists there. Um, and I'm going to take that um, and export it to a CSV. And let's see if I can find that real quick. Sorry, hold on one second, it's not coming up. There we go. And so finally, I have a full list of all the commandlets and do a filter on here. And I can say stuff like, uh, you know, which of these uh, versions of PowerShell have uh, Git help in them, for instance? Um, it actually looks like it exists in all of them. Uh, let's go back and say, uh, which one have uh, out grid view? Um, it actually looks like it's only in PowerShell 5, right? So, I mean, it's not the most useful thing in the world, but I just thought it was kind of cool just to show I mean, these commandlets came from all different sessions, um, some using SSH, some using WinRM, um, different OSs, Mac, Linux, Windows, and I was able to pull all that information back into um, one system and just generate a report about which ones have which commandlets. Um, that's pretty much it, unless uh, someone has any questions. Kevin, thanks very much, man. Good stuff. Well, then that's it for just me removing my sessions. So, guys, right? Any questions? That's been that was super interesting to try and just understand some of the practical application and getting some data around. Re remember, guys, um, if you would like to chat or just ask a question, just unmute your mic. 
Um, anybody's welcome to ask questions, and then soon we'll transition to just keep an open mic for anybody who wants to chat about stuff. Kevin, what would you say was the biggest hurdle for you to tackle when you started to try to do PowerShell and Linux? Like, number one basic thing that you just had to, like, forget in the Windows world or something. Um, I mean, PowerShell on Linux, um, I would say probably the, the first thing you're going to run into is, is case sensitivity. If you start messing around in PowerShell and Linux and you don't consider the fact that some things need to be lowercase or some things need to be uppercase, um, you're going to run into a ton of issues, especially if you start writing scripts and you're trying to run scripts and you don't think about case. Like I said, just the example of, um, you know, if you're doing grep with a capital G versus a lowercase g, right? That wouldn't matter if it was a select string, but it does matter because of the fact that it's grep. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest thing, but um, once using SSH, and the fact that SSH, I mean, it's just kind of the Linux way of remoting, um, that all seems to work pretty well. Um, I think it's a little bit, it's definitely gotten better as far as installing it on Windows, but it's still, um, you still have to mess around with some little things and make sure you get them, get it set up right, like the symbolic link and stuff I showed you, um, which a lot of that stuff that I showed is stuff that I've found on, um, like the links that I posted earlier. Um, I found on different sites where people have mentioned it. So, I mean, the information's all out there. I'll have, um, this I actually have a, a GitHub repo for with all of this code that I did. And um, the links from my PowerPoint, which is also in uh, my GitHub repo. And I'll put it in the um, the RTP repo as well. We had a question from David Stein. He was curious if you tried using SIM on Linux. Um, I did not. All right, David, maybe you <laughs> you use SIM on Linux. I'll be honest, I'm not a huge Linux guy. Um, I just in the past year really had to start using Linux. Um, and so I'm getting better at it, but um, yeah, I haven't done a whole lot with PowerShell Core and Linux other than making the connections, testing a few things out, um, and... So my thought is like, yeah, David, you asked a question, but what are you, what are you using SIM for? Because SIM isn't like, it, it's on top of WMI and stuff like that, but WMI doesn't exist in Linux. So I'm trying to think of, like, I can, I'm going to go look it up and see. Actually, that's not true. Yes, it's... WMI are the same thing. And if you happen to be in Chattanooga on Saturday, you can come to my session and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, really? Wait, you're saying that, that you can you can connect your WMI to a Linux machine? SIM and WMI are using the same access methods to, to pull data off the machine. The difference between SIM and WMI is that Windows took SIM, which at the time that it came out, had no standard for networking. So Microsoft bolted on the RPC and DCOM and called it WMI. They then came out in 2012 with a new version of, of, of this protocol by bolting on WinRM, WS Management, and called, uh, excuse me, WS Man, and then called it um, WinRM. So, and then if you notice, if you when you hit WMI or SIM, it's the same basic information stores that you're hitting. It's just the method that you transfer the data back from the machine remotely is different, whether it's SIM or WMI or WS, um, WS Man. So there's a SIM instance on a Linux host that you can connect to. There's a class, there's SIM classes. I, I don't know about Linux. I'm just saying what's the difference between SIM and WMI? Yeah, you can do some stuff on link. Linux, yeah. Okay. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, sorry. I was having trouble getting off the uh, mute. Um, yeah, so, so SIM is a open standard. WMI is built on top of SIM. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I so, that. yeah, what you were saying is correct. Microsoft extended SIM to make WMI. There's an open WMI variant um, for Linux. 
but it's not widely used. And then what would I use it for? Mostly inventory and status querying, kind of like SNMP for uh, networking. So, right, so uh, like, System Center uses it a lot. So, um, SCOM, um, they use WMI a lot for doing uh, inventory and status reporting. So I was trying to use something like that on the Linux platform, but ugh, it's, it's just not there. Okay. Cool. Cool. But that's still, this is a great session. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, didn't mean to take it off on a side tangent there. No, man. Yeah, that's good. Good, good conversation. Tangent. So actually, you kind of just answered a question for me because I'm doing a presentation on Saturday, and I wasn't sure how much to talk about SIM versus WMI, and I think maybe I might spend more than one slide on that. But you only have two slides. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> That's oh, no. Why. <laughs> I have 40, 45 slides for 45 minutes. All right. Guess I'm going to a different session. Yeah. That's fine with me. I only have one slide. <laughs> all right. I am on screen this showing? weekend. Yeah, it is, Kevin. Okay. Um Oh, look at you, man. Get your little animation. Yeah, I threw a couple in there. Um, so just some links that I forgot to show earlier. If anyone wants to reach out to me, connect. Feel free to add me. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording at this point, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, everybody. I'm glad, I'm glad you recorded.